Hello, Earthlings. How you doing? Welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. Let's start off with our cosmic weather for today. Over at spaceweather.com, we can see that our solar wind is at 375.9 kilometers per second. Our planetary K index is currently at a 1, expected to be no more than a 3 within the next 24 hours. We have a 40% chance of having some sort of M-class flare and very low chance that we're going to have anything of X-class nature. And we have about a 25% chance, 15, a little bit lower, over the next 24 hours of having a geomagnetic storm of some degree or another. Now, right here, we could see that solar flare emerging over the sun's south southeastern limb, sunspot AR-1389, unleashed M2-class solar flare. At 1350 Universal Time on the 29th, the blast shows that the newly visible sunspot is capable of significant eruptions. AR-1389 is not yet facing Earth, but it is turning in our direction. NOAA forecasters have downgraded the chance of a geomagnetic storm on December 29th to 20% chance. A CME is still expected to arrive later today, but the longer it takes to get here, the weaker its impact and likely to be a storm. If you remember, just the other day we had this uh, big flare that came off of the sun that hit the planet or is directed towards the planet. And yesterday and today are the days that it was projected to hit. And so if you notice any kind of strangeness in the weather, any uh, you know colors in the sky, things that are affected in a geomagnetic way, that's probably what it's from. Now, energetically, with the planets and the stars, our sun is in the sign of Capricorn, and it's going to be there, you know, for another couple of weeks yet. Remember, Capricorn's an Earth sign. Things that occur during this time are very Earth-oriented, um, and we are challenged during this time to look past the illusions of what we see going on in the world, in the physical world, and the earthly matters, and learn to look past them to see that there's something deeper behind. You know, it's like in the winter time we know that there's something more hidden underneath the snow, hidden underneath all the ice and the things that, that come up, and that's just sort of a, a rough example, but it's kind of the idea. We learn to look that what we see now isn't necessarily exactly the way it is. So we're learning to look past the illusions of things. The moon, which is our subconscious, is in Pisces, and Pisces, the, the fish, they swim in the opposite directions. Water is representational of emotions, so you have these two fish swimming in a in a sea of emotions going one way and the other. The trick with uh, Piscean energy is to find a balance because there's a tendency to want to go one direction and then before completing something go in the other direction and then back and forth. And so if you can find a way to balance out that energy of continuously going back and forth but directing it, you can move forward smoothly and that's the uh, challenge of working with that Piscean energy so between the Capricorn Sun and the Piscean energy you know we have a lot that we're working with and it's all about going inside and just really learning to work with the energies that we have inside seeing past the illusions of life so that we can really direct our energy where it needs to go and not be pulled in different directions our moon phase is already up to 26 percent moving towards that full moon it's probably going to be another oh, about another 10 days or so because it's usually about two weeks that it takes to go from a new moon all the way up to a full moon so we are in that waxing phase making our way up and our dream spell for today shows us that it is a white rhythmic dog day energetically what this means the white is the color of refinement so we're reminded to think about the energy and the way that we're refining and working with the energies around us the rhythmic tone teaches us the lessons of balance that all of life is about balance and the more we can learn to balance out the energies we're working with the more we are in rhythm and in sync with with life and the way life is moving and our symbol which is called the daykin and the guide for today are both the same they're the dog and the dog's about love and loyalty. So take all of these ideas, all these energies we just talked about, kind of put them all together, 
and that'll help you understand a little bit of what energy we're working with today. The phrase for this symbol today is, I organize in order to love balancing loyalty. I seal the process of heart with the rhythmic tone of equality. I am guided by my own power doubled. And today is a galactic activation portal day where the energy is more intensified because you have the meeting of the energy in the columns with the energy in the rows and on the Zulkin and together they come and they form an extra energy cycle, energy place. On the Gregorian calendar it is Thursday the 29th of December. So we have one more show after today to take us to the end of the year and then we are on into 2012. Certainly a time that has been talked about for quite some time by a lot of people on this planet including yours truly. Alright so we're going to start things off with a story that comes to us. It's out of Infowars.com. It was posted up here, reposted by Amy 2X. And this is Gerald Salente. Now Gerald is a trends forecaster. He is on Infowars quite a bit. You can find his videos online um, all over the place. Just Google it, Gerald Salente. And he talks about what is going on with the financial system, with the banking system, where we're headed and his trends and the things that they talk about are pretty insightful so if you haven't heard of anything of his in the past I would encourage you to go and look him up just google his name and listen to some of his other videos and it'll help to you to understand a little bit more of what's going on if alright so let me stop rambling here let me take you right to this video so you can hear for yourself exactly what Gerald Salente has to say. Here we go. Wednesday, I called up HSBC and I told them that I was coming in Thursday morning at 9.30 in the morning to make a withdrawal. I gave them the amount. They said they only could give it to me in hundreds and fifties. If I wanted to wait until Monday, I could get it in hundreds. I said, no, it's fine. I'll take it in hundred and fifties. I couldn't make it at 9.30. I had my assistant call him up. Mr. Slenty will be in at 2.30. I go there with the check, hand it to the person I was talking to on the phone. It was like I never called. Now they tell me I have to go over. I have this video on our site. I have to go over and talk to the bank manager. There I go over there. I sit down. She looks at me, and you talked about it, these power-hungry little people. She said to me, "What? this is a sizable amount of money. What are you going to use it for? So I said, how about none of your business? She said, that's not very friendly. I said, how about none of your effing business? How dare you ask me? what I'm going to do with my money. She said, well, you have to comply. I said, I don't, you didn't ask me how I got the money in there, and now you're asking me what I'm going to do with it? They're saying you're a criminal. Did they imply you're a criminal? Exactly. This went on for 40 minutes. I'm talking to people all over the HSBC chain. First, she tells me to leave the office. She has to talk to compliance officers. Yeah, that's like these people that get arrested now for trying to get their own money out. Wait, wait, are you saying you have a video where you break this down or there's video of this? No, no, I have video where I break it down. I wish I did have a video. You want to go back in there? Oh, my God. Tell us what else happened, Gerald. Break this. Oh, my gosh. And I'll tell you her name. It was Penny Demo. Try Demolition. And I told her, I said, you know, I'm going to make you famous. I'm going to tell everybody what a jerk you are and how dare you ask me what I do with my money. And now you're telling me you have to make a call to somebody and I can't be in the room as you talk about my money. So now this goes on and it goes on. And I'm demanding to talk to other people. I get some woman... Mr. Salenti, now, you should have called the bank up ahead of time. And I said, I called yesterday. My assistant called again today. She said, but we have to. 
we have to know what you're doing with your money. I said, listen, if she didn't tell you, I'll tell you. It's none of your damn business what I do with my money. Now, listen, I know I could have said, I'm going to buy a car, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. I said, screw this, I'm not telling him anything. She said to me, well, Uncle Sam wants to know. I said, listen, tell Uncle Sam to give me a call. And we could talk about well, let's it. stop right there. I did the same thing, but I didn't go in. I came in here Friday so angry that I was bouncing off the walls because they were calling me over and over again Thursday. I finally started talking to them at this local bank, and the guy's like, sir, we've got to fill out this report on you to the feds. And I'm like, well, why is it any of their business? He goes, sir, we're not spying on you. And I said, what do you mean you're not spying? you got to fill a report out to me on the feds. He goes, well, new rules are coming in. And blah, blah, blah. I said, I thought it was above this amount. This is below that amount. We're sorry, sir. Don't be paranoid. We know about your radio show. Oh, so I'm the paranoid one that in America, this isn't even that much money. I mean, I might be able to buy a golf cart with it, maybe. I mean, not even a car. That in America, I can't even get some cash out without being treated like trash. And that's what this whole system is about with Patriot Act compliance is turning everybody into little agents, having them all spy. So then I start yelling at them. Well, this is in the morning at home. My wife runs in what's wrong. I say, you talk to him. She calls him back. She starts yelling because they start telling her she's paranoid. Then I call him back. Then they're acting all weird. Then they wouldn't come to the phone. I said, I'm coming down there if you don't get on the phone. So then, oh, the guy that was at lunch at 1030 in the morning, he's now there and comes and gets on the phone. But again, again, you're absolutely right, Gerald. They... they <sighs> I've got you here as a guest. I'm ranting. Let's continue. So did you ever even get your money? Yeah, I got my money. But what I'm telling you, and this is why I kept going public with what's going on, they don't have the money. Yeah, they have the money, but they need your money so they can keep gambling. Doesn't anybody get it? That's why That's why the CME group, although that big mouth Clarence Terry is saying that, or, or Terrence Duffy. Duffy is saying that they have a hundred billion dollars they couldn't come up with 1.2 billion to cover the bad bets that's like all of las vegas closing down because one casino can't cover the bets they don't have the money this whole thing is financially leveraged beyond what ponzi could have ever imagined so what they're doing is they're trying to make it as impossible as it can be for you to get your hands on your money because they need it to gamble. So what I'm telling everybody is if you don't have your money in your pocket, you don't own it, period, paragraph. And as I said, the first trend, and I broke it on your station before anybody else, I told you, watch out for economic martial law. It's coming. This is the UFO News with Joshua Poet. All right, Dirk, thank you very much. This is the UFO News. All right, let's see what we got here. First story comes to us from the Mirror. It says, UFO sightings up 70% in Ireland over the last three years. The UFO Research Association of Ireland revealed that 59 incidents were reported in 2011 compared with 42 the year before and just 35 in 2009. Association founder Adam Tellen suggested people are becoming more open to the possibility of UFOs and therefore feel more comfortable reporting a sighting to its website. I would like to believe that there's life out there in the universe somewhere, whether it's walking or talking beings or microscopic, microscopic bacteria. I don't know, said Mr. Tellen. The association has been able to attribute most sightings to ball lightning and Chinese lanterns, but its main interests lie in UFOs that cannot be explained by conventional means. According to its website, these include Incidents where the objects seem to be intelligently controlled or have been carrying out precise maneuvers that are impossible for any known air or spacecraft. 
As a young child, I saw something strange in the night sky, said Mr. Tellen. But I was young. It's very possible that the incident was embellished over the years and was nothing more than a meteor or some other natural phenomenon. Mr. Tellen founded the group in 2005, but it officially became UFO Research Association of Ireland in 2008 when it adopted its current system to track reported incidents. All right. Our next story comes to us here out of latest-ufosightings.net. Triangle UFO over Moscow. We've been seeing a few sightings over Moscow recently. There's another most recent one. Let's see what we have here. Okay, there we go. We got the sighting in question. All right, smack dab in the middle. And we've all seen this bright white light before. Let's move right ahead. All right. We got a series of lights. We know it's not one big light now. We can differentiate as three lights in a triangular formation. All right. And that appears to be the bulk of the viewing. All right. So there you go. That's the UFO sighting in Moscow on the 29th. We now have a sighting that took place daytime over North Hollywood, California. The footage is unknown object in the sky above North Hollywood recorded on the 28th. December. Let's see what this looks like. All right. There we go. We got the object in question right there. Well, that's an interesting looking one. The way it, uh, the way it shimmers like that. It looks like one light or a series of lights. Keep fast forwarding here, see if we see any more of it. All right, there you go, and it keeps bouncing around. Either that or the camera is bouncing around, but that's our sighting in North Hollywood, California. And then last, we have a story from UFO Digest. My close encounter in the moment I knew my purpose. This was by Third Kind Survivor. I would like to share the single most important experience in my life with all of you. The moment I became a believer and the driving force behind every breath I have taken since. Almost 10 years ago, when I was 12, I was playing in the field behind my house with my best friend, Elisa. We always played outside because, well, something which I didn't fully grasp at the time was that Elisa was black and I am white and my grandfather, who lived with us, didn't want her in the house. He didn't tell me this directly and at the time, all I knew was that he hung out outside around because if we went inside, he would get angry. So we were outside talking about school and our friends in the late fall, and I was getting, it was getting very cold. We were also talking about how we probably wouldn't see each other outside of school much anymore because of the winter coming. We talked about this. It was kind of sad, and we wound up talking later than we usually did. And the first time, discussed the reasons why my grandpa did not want her to come over. We hit the nail on the head, and we both cried for a while, and later I got my first kiss. My spirits really lifted then, and I felt that I had started to understand a little more of the mysterious nature of reality that had been so opaque in my childhood. I was happy, and then they took her. I did not see a direct manifestation of technology like the spacecraft so frequently discussed by my fellows throughout the compendium of knowledge on this website. I observed instead a great flash of light followed by what seemed to be like all of the stars converging into a large field a mere hundred yards or so from me. It was at that point a man, if you could call him that, who introduced himself as phonetically Klarm, asked us which of us should go with him back to his world. He told us that humans from our world have been infiltrating his dimension for decades, but was unsure how long that actually was in our star cycle. He had brown and leathery skin, wore no clothes, and had one large red eye in the center of his head with no mouth to speak of. I could not as a child understand how he was speaking, but I now believe it was through some sort of psychic channel. After telling both of us secrets of the physical construct of the universe and the portals from beyond, he decided without either of our consent to take Alyssa. Nobody believed me when I told him what had happened. A few days later, when she had officially become a missing person, I briefly and then soon after my grandfather were taken into custody. 
Both of us remember first talking to police and then to men in black suits who refused to show their authority but appeared to be superior to the police in behavior and body language. They asked me questions about the man from the middle dimension and I answered truthfully where they were whereafter they released me. They asked my grandfather the same questions and he became belligerent and demanded a lawyer. Later he was released, never having been formally charged, but being held in secret for over five days. Every attempt he had to bring a civil suit against the government for this infringement of his rights was thrown out before reaching trial. To this day no one has seen or heard of my childhood friend. My grandfather was considered to be her killer by her family, and I saw no option other than to move away, never talking to anyone from my hometown again. I know this idea does not contain any supporting evidence, and I know not everyone will believe what I say is true. This is simply food for thought. Very interesting food for thought indeed. Very interesting indeed. All right, let's jump away to a song, and uh, I'll be right back. What if our government was responsible for some of the greatest crimes against this nation? Would you really want to know? These are big questions, but these questions deserve answers. It's time to demand the truth. time to demand the truth my friends every day it's time to demand the truth don't you think all right so let's see we're going to move into our next story actually I have a couple stories going to deal with Ron Paul first one here well, this is a story that they recently played on Fox and this Ron Paul could win the nomination and the presidency let's listen to this because this isn't normally what you hear Fox News saying. So let's listen. Well, there is a new leader in the Republican pack in Iowa, folks, as we count down to the caucuses a week from yesterday. 
Ron Paul maintains a first place position against his rivals in the Hawkeye State ahead of next Tuesday's contest. With all the last minute jockeying for votes, Congressman Paul leads the nominee preference public policy poll with 24%. Mitt Romney is in second at 20%. Newt Gingrich now third at 13. Doug Weed is senior advisor to the presidential candidate, Ron Paul, and he is with me now. Doug, welcome to the program. It's great to have you. Hi. Thanks, Megan. All right, so this is coming as good news to you, but now you've got all these folks, and Ron Paul continues to be first in a lot of polls, and I think under the Real Clear uh, Politics average. He's up there as well, but you've got a lot of folks suggesting he could win Iowa. It's not going to go any further than that. And to those folks, you say what? <laughs> well, winning Iowa is a big deal. The last two presidents of the United States, uh, Barack Obama and George W. Bush, won Iowa and lost New Hampshire and went on to win the nomination in the presidency. So if your template works in Iowa, and your advertising, your coalitions, your ground game, your message resonates in Iowa, it's a good example of how it will resonate other places, uh, of course, tweaked for regions. So it's a good sign. It's not a bad sign. But what's the plan to, to parlay a victory or even a you know second place or maybe third place finish in Iowa? How do you parlay that? into success in later states where Congressman Paul may not be polling as well? Uh, the same template. The people of Iowa have focused on this race. The people in California that are voting in a national poll of Gallup or Rasmussen aren't focused on who they're actually going to vote for. Uh, last night, we had a very well-dressed businesswoman uh, come to us uh, for our practice caucus practices in Iowa. And uh, w someone pulled her aside and said, no, why are you supporting Ron Paul? She said, he's the purest protest I can make against the corruption in Washington, D.C. Ron Paul's kind of pulled the curtain back on that. There's always been corruption, but the scale of corruption in Washington, D.C. now is so bad, he's the purest vote, uh, always voted against uh, uh, tax increases, unbalanced budget, gave back $100,000 of his own congressional allowance. If you want a pure protest vote, it was Ron Paul. And we think when the people in New Hampshire, as the polls are already beginning to show there, and the people in South Carolina focus uh, and make their decision, uh, we're going to do very well. When they see our commercials, we're going to do very well. Yeah, you've been, you've been, I mean, I was in Iowa for the debate on December 15th, and I can say you, you guys have certainly peppered the airwaves with ads against Gingrich and Romney and others. I want to ask you about the news today that Gary Johnson, who had been a Republican candidate for president, is now going to run on the Libertarian ticket. That's your guys' thing, Libertarian uh, ideals, although Gary Johnson shares them as well. Ron Paul has not closed the door to a possible third-party ticket run if he doesn't wind up as the GOP nominee. Your thoughts on the announcement from Gary Johnson today? Well, uh, Ron Paul's not an absolutist, and that's the only reason uh, it, it, that he leaves a little bit of the door open. And the last time around, the Republican Party didn't treat him very well. And the fact that he's a contender and a player and is going to win the nomination, it's a moot point. Uh, the poll last night, the PPP poll you referred to, showed a remarkable thing. It showed Ron Paul leading among evangelical Christians in Iowa over Perry, Bachman, and Gingrich. That bodes well for South Carolina. It bodes well for him winning the nomination and the presidency. And the Washington Post poll just three days ago showed him doing better than Gingrich against Barack Obama and a statistical tie with Mitt Romney within the margin of error against Barack Obama. So <laughs> who's talking about third party? We're talking about winning in Iowa and making a run for it, if not winning, in New Hampshire and uh, winning the nomination. You know, one of the issues, obviously, you know that Congressman Paul is most controversial on is his foreign policy stance, and in particular Israel and Iran, and whether he would allow Iran to get the bomb. He said he doesn't want it, but he doesn't want it because he's worried that the United States will then go to war with Iran, and he doesn't want that, just the same as he didn't want the Iraq war. He thinks we're too, uh, too prone to, to attacking other countries and to, you know, in, 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 to injecting ourselves militarily. Uh, Newt Gingrich came out and said, Given that kind of attitude and, and policy stance, it would be a tough choice for Americans if the choice came down to Barack Obama versus Ron Paul. And Ron Paul is to the left of Barack Obama on certain issues, including foreign policy with respect to Iran. To those voters, I, I, Richard I, I, Newt Gingrich, what do you say? Sir? Yeah, yeah, I totally disagree with uh, the, the, that idea that he's to the left or the right. He's pro-Constitution. He's in favor of taking the idea of war. He's not against war. Uh, he was the only public figure in 1981 to stand up 
and defend Israel's right to defend herself and take out those Iraqi nuclear facilities. He's not against war. He's in favor of going to the U.S. Congress, as the Constitution says, debating it, committing to war, getting in, winning it, and then getting out. He's against these endless wars that just uh, happen uh, uh, at a whim because somebody uh, believes that someone's a threat to the United States. If there is serious threat to the United States and or our allies, uh, then let's take it to Congress, let's discuss it, let's commit, and let's get in and win it and get out. Doug, last question for you, and uh, forgive me if this is uh, impolitic. But Ron Paul, 76 year, years old, is, is there a concern that his age might be an issue for him in going after this nomination? <laughs> you know, the, the real problem is getting right on the issues, not having the right age. Barack Obama's got the right age, but he is totally wrong on the issues. And uh, the people who are voting for us in Iowa and who support us in Iowa are people who've lost the value of their homes. They've lost the value of their IRAs. They're students who are paying 8% interest on a student loan, while billionaires are getting 0% interest-free loans to stimulate the economy. And they're fed up with that corruption. And his message resonates regardless of his age. Uh, the hard part is getting right on the issues. And Ron Paul's been able to do that this cycle. Well, I know you're much more uh, focused right now on that number 24% that puts him in, the, in first place uh, in, the, in the latest PPP Iowa poll, 24% over Romney's 20 than you are on uh, the number 76. Doug, all the best. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Megan. All right, very good. Now, the only 76 we're thinking about is 1776, all right? That was the important time. Unfortunately, we don't hear a lot of that kind of talk from the president who's in office or any of the other candidates except for Ron Paul, he seems the to be the only one that's standing up for the Constitution and the real rights of Americans. And it doesn't matter about his age. I mean, if you think about, you know, the shamans, most of the time when you see it and you hear the stories of the tribes and the shamans, the shamans are usually the elders of the tribe, the ones who have gained the wisdom and experience. That's what you want, not someone who's going to you know, not have any ideas or experience. Look what we have right now. No experience, no ideas, nothing's getting done. And then look at the other candidates that are out there. We have Newt Gingrich. Newt Gingrich is putting down Ron Paul's supporters, many of who are veterans, saying, I believe he used the word indecent people. Really? Someone who went out, joined the military, fought, protected this country, is an, an indecent person? Really? And, and Newt Gingrich could actually say that? That's not right. That is not an American. That is a traitor. And he should never be in office because it's very evident that he would abuse his power. He's abused his power all along with all the different ethics violations. So you think he's going to get in office and suddenly he's going to be a guy who's going to be ethical? I don't think so. I don't think he's going to be ethical because he doesn't know what ethics is, apparently. Now, one of the biggest supporters of Ron Paul is the military. Ron Paul has more support from the military than, and that's active duty and veterans than Obama, and he has more support than all of the other Republican candidates combined. So when you hear to talk about the foreign policy that he has, well, the troops, the ones who are out there engaged in this war of terror and engaged in all the battles that, and the fighting, they support Ron Paul. They don't want to be out fighting. We should listen to what they have to say because they are the ones that are actually out there with the guns in their hands, boots on the ground, out there involved in these conflicts. So if you're sitting at home on your cushy couch eating you know, your food as you watch television, it's real easy for you to say that, you know, he's not good, his foreign policy is not good. But why don't you try putting on a military uniform, go overseas and, and fight and really get to know what this is all about. And if you do, you might have a different idea about his foreign policy. I guess it just all depends on your perspective. And the perspective that a lot of Americans unfortunately seem to have is a warlike perspective. And when did a warlike perspective become the perspective we should have? When does the Bible say that we should go to war. Where in the Ten Commandments is a provision for going to war? I don't recall any. So 
Americans, before you get so high and mighty and talk about this foreign policy and how we should be at war, think twice about what you're saying because unless you're willing to put the boots on and a gun in your hand and go fight for yourself, you need to shut up and you need to pay attention to what's going on and you need to quit listening to the warmongers who are convincing you and brainwashing you into thinking that going out and killing another human being for oil is what you need to do. Learn what's really going on out there. Because if you really learn what's going on, you're going to start realizing that all of these politicians are just talking nonsense. They're talking out of their ass. And you've got to stop listening to that. Listen to the intelligence that's out there because there's a lot. Ron Paul has a lot of intelligence. He shouldn't be put down and he shouldn't be, his supporters shouldn't be put down, especially those who went and fought and died for this country. Now, I'm going to play just a short clip, only a few moments, because this is an hour and 29 minutes long, hour and a half, this next video. But I just want to play the beginning part just to introduce you. The link is up. This is Ron Paul's full rally, full speech he did for the veterans. So let me go ahead and play a little bit of this for you just to get you started. In Des Moines, Iowa, to hear from GOP presidential candidate Ron Paul. He arrived here a short time ago at the Iowa State Fairgrounds. It's a salute to veterans rally. Uh, the Texas congressman wrote an op-ed in today's Des Moines Register focusing on his record on veterans issues. This is leading up to the Iowa caucuses, which are happening next week on January 3rd. Just zip forward a little bit. The group up here are also all veterans, and the program is a honor to veterans by veterans. And of course, the veteran we're going to honor the most tonight will be our special guest that we will introduce a little later. But, uh, but until then, I want to extend that uh, greetings to all of you. And uh, talking about dates to remember, the birthday of Iowa, and I predict to do to you today that another great date to remember will be January the 3rd, 2012. We're going to make history, I believe. We already have, and we're going to finish it off, all right? And it is all of you, collectively, and in particular the vets that we're honoring tonight, that have the ability, capability, desire to do that, and we're going to make it happen. So, with that, we're going to start our program, and uh, it is my pleasure to ask Crystal McIntyre, who was in the United States Army in the Intelligence Corps from 1988 to 91, to lead us in a Pledge of Allegiance. So please stand for the pledge. And remain standing for the prayer, and the prayer will be followed by Ron Duncan. And Ron Duncan served in the United States Air Force. He was an air police with the Strategic Air Command from 1962 to 68. So we'll start with Crystal, and then we'll go then to Ron Duncan for the prayer. Thank you very much. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing for the prayer. Thank you, Crystal, and thank everyone for coming tonight. Uh, I would like to open up, just before the prayer, if I may, uh, if I may reach back into the very deep corridors of our American history. Over 200 years ago, in 1768, Pastor Richard Salters, election sermon to his congregation of Mansfield, Connecticut, 
stated in this one paragraph. God never gives men up to be slaves till they lose their national virtue and abandon themselves to slavery. Let us pray, please. Heavenly Father, we come to you in this great land in which you have entrusted us to keep. Restore our faith and preserve the integrity and destiny of our nation. Give us an understanding of the time and the hours set before us. Comfort those who have lost their loved ones, protecting our citizens here on our soil and those great defenders who came out of our ranks to defend us abroad. Give each one of us a measure of courage as you did our founders and protect our men and women in uniform. And may our children never feel the heavy chains of tyranny. May the God of our fathers lead us to victory in this great endeavor. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. All right, that's where I'm going to pause this one. And I'm going to leave this to you to watch the rest. It's an hour and a half long. It's really good. It's the full rally of what's going on out there in Iowa. Now, moving right ahead. Our next story here, well, this also involves Ron Paul. And this is uh, Michelle Bachman's chair defects to Ron Paul. In a shock announcement Wednesday night, Iowa State Senator and one-time Michelle Bachman campaign leader, Ken Sorensen declared that he is now supporting Ron Paul for president. Sorensen made the announcement at a Paul rally with veteran here in Des Moines, telling the crowd, I believe we're at a turning point in this campaign. Calling the decision to abandon Bachman a painful one, Sorensen said he felt obliged to join Paul as the Republican establishment tries to undermine his campaign. I thought it was my duty to come to his aid, just like he came to my aid during my Senate race, which was a very nasty race, Sorensen said, pledging to go all out for Paul over the next few days. So support continues to come in for Ron Paul, and it will continue to come in. Now, what is it about this Ron Paul revolution that is catching on? It's the truth. It's this man is speaking up for the Constitution. It's something we're not hearing from the current president or the president before, or other politicians who are up there running for office, other candidates. You're not hearing that. So people of this country, the good people that make up the United States of America, well, they're rallying behind the words and the wisdom of the Founding Fathers. And as such, they're finding comfort in what Ron Paul has to say because he's defending the words of the Founding Fathers, whereas everyone else seems to be wanting to tear them down say that the Constitution needs to be writ rewritten, saying that the words in the Constitution are old and outdated, that it's just a piece of paper. All of these things are nonsense by an organization, an administration that has gone crazy, that has gone haywire and is running amok out there with their own particular agendas. Those individuals, and they make up a small minority, they need to be thrown out, put in jail, and new people need to be put in place. That is what is the opportunity of the American citizens to do. But you have to really be able to pay attention and you have to be able to use your own sense of discernment in all of these matters. If you are still buying into the war propaganda that is being put out, then you need to really ask yourself why that is. If you believe in, in, in their propaganda and talk about their propaganda of war, yet you yourself are not willing to go out there, put a gun in your hand and go fight, then you need to consider where your real values lie. Because there's a contradiction, don't you think? If you're believing that war is good, war is good, war is good, but you won't go fight, somehow there's a contradiction in your mind that has been set up. And you need to understand where that is. And what you'll find is that your true value is you don't believe in war. And you don't believe in the fighting. But you've allowed your mind, your intellect, to be invaded by propaganda that has told you that war is good. And so you have this contradiction going on. You don't believe in war, but you think war is good. You don't believe is war, but you should have a president who wants to be warlike. Think about that, my friends. Think about the contradictions going on and see if you can find where that division line is and get rid of the division line. Go with your integrity. Your integrity says no war. Well, that's the way to go. That's the way to go. So pay attention to your integrity in that regard. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Don't let a government, an agency, tell you that you have to go fight because they want you to go fight. Because I'm guaranteeing you, if you look behind what is really the reason of these wars, you're going to find the most insane reasons. Oil. 
Many of these wars are fought over oil. Really? Is that worth the price of dying? Is the oil in these other countries the worth the, your, the life of your family member who may have died or your friend? I don't think so. But because we're in such a state that we're in where we've made oil the greatest thing that we have, then that's what we're going to be dealing with. But there's so many other options out there available, alternative forms of energy that we could be looking at and dealing with. If we just pay attention and allow these things to grow, just imagine what this country could really be. Instead of a country that is producing nothing but war, we could actually be producing something of a creative nature out into the world. And that would be really, really a great thing. Now, moving right along, our next story here takes us to the old TSA. Well, they confiscated some cupcakes and some candy, but they allow a man to walk through the checkpoint with a sword. You tell me what kind of sense any of this makes. The TSA did not stop at opening Christmas presents at airport checkpoints this holiday season. In two separate incidents, agents decreed that tasty Christmas treats constituted a security threat, while in another incident, a man simply strolled through carrying a sword. A Massachusetts woman ran into trouble with agents at Las Vegas McCarran International Airport on Christmas Eve when they discovered a frosted cupcake in her luggage. Oh no, not a frosted cupcake. According to ABC News, the agent was confused about what to do with the potential offensive weapon and so called in a supervisor who declared that the Devella vanilla bourbon icing could be a security risk as it constituted a gel-like substance. Worse still, the woman, Rebecca Haynes, had no trouble with the cupcake on an earlier flight. The TSA at Logan Airport said the cupcake looked delicious and told us to have a great trip, she said, but in Las Vegas, they were dangerous. They shouldn't be delicious in one part of the country and a security threat in the other, she added, calling the TSA security theater. This really isn't about the cupcake. It's about the bigger issue, and it's about indicative of the fact that broader reforms need to be made to the TSA because they are not keeping us safe. In a similar incident, TSA at Gerald R. Ford International Airport held up a security line when an oddly placed iPod and bag of candy triggered a security alarm. Commuter Lauren Van Ooflin said seven other travelers consequently missed their flight to Chicago. In response, the TSA issued a statement that, in part read, there was no impact to flight operations and no delays occurred. Well, at what point are people going to put their foot down about the TSA? How many times should someone have an excuse? Think about this. If this was your child, if this was your friend, and every time that they made a mistake, they had an excuse, and they made an excuse, how many excuses would you accept before you realize that all they were doing was lying to you one after time after another? How many? Come on, you guys are smart. You wouldn't accept very many. Yet we see these excuses all the time. Really? A cupcake? A TSA agent at McCarran International Airport doesn't have the brains to know that a cupcake is not a terrorist weapon? Yet we have a, a sword go through? Someone just carries a sword through? And that's accepted. But a cupcake is... Something's not right, my friends. Something's not right. And somebody thinks that you Americans are really, really stupid. And that's why they do all of these things and put out these stupid excuses because they expect you're going to say and do nothing. But a lot of you are surprising them because you are speaking up. And that's confusing them and it's really upsetting the process that they have in mind. Now, here's another one. This comes to us from Impeach Obama campaign. This is a tweet about illegal aliens. Obama is watching you. The Obama administration is using fake Facebook and Twitter accounts to monitor anyone who mentions such mundane political issues as illegal immigration, oil drilling, or even recovery. The newest invasion of conservative pri privacy comes courtesy of the Department of Homeland Security. Rob Waugh of the UK Daily Mail reports, the DSA, DHS outlined plans to scan blogs, Twitter, and Facebook for words such as illegal immigrant, outbreak, drill, strain, virus, recovery, death, collapse, human to animal, and Trojan, according to the impact assessment document filed by the agency. When it searched tools 
net an account using the phrases they record personal information it's still not clear how the information is used and who the DHS shares it with well first of all they shouldn't be doing this second of all we have a president who's a fake is it surprising that the administration would have a fake Facebook account and a fake Twitter account and what exactly does that mean a fake account so they have an account but they really don't or they have an account under somebody else's name this is just them wanting to watch you now I heard a bit of a discussion about this the other day on Fox News I forget which show it was but there was a guest on there and the guest said something that just was unbelievable the guest made a comment that something to the effect that on Facebook if your account is hacked that and if you're I believe his words were something that if you're if you're stupid enough to have your account hacked or your information taken then you have no right no constitutional rights this is what someone actually said now how many people have listened to that and actually agree that that is the case you see these talking heads want you to believe that every little thing you do means taking away your constitutional rights they want you to get used to the fact that your constitutional rights are pulled away from you and that's just the way it goes because it's an old outdated piece of paper and it really has no validity in our society today however those who have fought and died those who have read the Constitution those who have any sort of intelligence at all understand that the Constitution is more than just a piece of paper it's a document that defines who this country is and unless we stand up for what the words are in there then we really aren't standing up for this country and the ideals and beliefs and if we don't stand up for that before long it's all gonna be gone and people are gonna be wondering what happened where did it go how did this disappear because you weren't paying attention that's how so pay attention make 2012 the year that you really pay attention because others are and according to this last article here they're paying attention to what you post to what you tweet these are just one place there's lots of places where they're paying attention to what you're saying out there and what you're doing you need to pay attention to see what they're paying attention to you about now before we get on to our meditation I'm gonna end with uh, one last little story here this is a kind of a funny good story it's Ron Paul again and this is over at the convention and well you'll see and it just should make a make you laugh put a little smile on your face here we go There you go, a little clowning around over there. All right, let's do our meditation, my friends. I want you to uh, close your eyes and relax. Close your eyes and relax. I want you to imagine yourself walking along a path. Now imagine a long, 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 long path. And I want you to look behind you. And the end of that path where you started from we're going to say that's 2010. December 31st, 2010. And where you are right now, well, you're all the way down the path. A year away. And just think back to all of the things that you have done over the course of this year. The journey that you have taken. And yes, you will find that as you think about the journey you have taken you'll remember things that you hadn't thought of in a while you'll remember things that you forgot because it was so long ago 
And as you think about this journey you took over the course of this year, consider all the ways that you've grown over the course of this year through the things that you have learned, through the things that you have done. And as you realize all of those things, feel good about the path that you have walked. Feel good about the journey that you have been on. And as you look ahead, just a few steps away, short distance away, is the end of this journey. And a time where we can sit and take a break. And as you take these last steps along the way, just really take into account all that you have done. And allow your mind to process this information. For it's been a long year and you've done a lot of things. To process that information and while you're doing that and just allowing yourself to sit with that energy and that for the next day, let's send from our heart chakra right now love all around the world to everybody around the planet. And let's think a good thought for everybody in the world. Let's think a good thought that everybody is able to end this day and this path and this year in a very positive productive way and as we're thinking good thoughts for everybody let's bring our energy and attention back to the present moment on the count of three three coming back to the present moment filled with confidence two coming back to the present moment filled with faith and one coming back to the present moment happy healthy and whole happy healthy and whole and there you have it that's our prayer our meditation for today so we've nearly made it to the end of this year we have one more show to go this will be our tomorrow will be our last show for 2011 after that we'll be on into 2012 so what we're going to do tomorrow is this is our third time that we're we're on the air during a new year new year's time we're going to do a goal setting workshop I believe that goals help us to focus where we're going, to focus how we're going to use our energy. So we're going to do a goal setting workshop the same as we've done the last two years at this time. And we're going to start this in the second half of the hour. And we're just going to do for 20 minutes and we're going to set some basic goals and some different categories and areas of our lives so that as we move forward we can be have a focusing point, have a direction of where we're going. So. What I want you to do between now and then is just contemplate some of these ideas of the goals of the things you want to to work on and do during the course of this next year. And we'll commit all of that to paper tomorrow. We'll get that process started and we'll continue on from there. All right. So we'll do that tomorrow. In the meantime, that's the show for today. Go out into the world. Have a great day. I'll be back tomorrow and uh, we'll continue on till then. Be safe. Peace. I'm out of here.